Bacterial Evolution at Georgia Tech. Recently, there was a press release that came out of Georgia Tech regarding the evolution of a, quote, 500 million year old gene, end quote, that was, quote, resurrected, put into an E. coli bacterium, and then allowed to evolve. Kind of a catchy little thing. Um, what's going on? What do they mean by resurrection? How do they know it's 500 million years old? Um, uh, what about the evolution they're talking about? Um, there's the actual press release. It's uh, the front page of it. It's a screenshot. And uh, um, it's entitled Giving Ancient Life Another Chance to Evolve. And so let's look at that. Um, Scientists place 500 million year old gene in modern organism. It's a project 500 million years in the making. Only this time, instead of playing on a movie screen in Jurassic Park, it's happening in a lab at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Kind of almost wants you make, uh, makes you want to go to Georgia Tech. Uh, which is, of course, precisely why they're using that kind of terminology. Using a process called paleo-experimental evolution, Georgia Tech researchers have resurrected a 500 million year old gene from bacteria and inserted it into modern day Escherichia coli bacteria. This bacterium has now been growing for more than a thousand generations, giving the scientists a front row seat to observe evolution in action. This is as close as we can get to the rewinding and replaying the molecular tape of life, said scientist Bitul uh, Kachar. Um, that C is supposed to have one of those little doodads that. Uh, come in France, and unfortunately I can't remember the name of it, the one that's in Francois. Um, an a NASA astrobiology postdoctoral fellow in Georgia Tech's NASA Center for Ribosomal Origins and Evolution. Um, the ability to observe an ancient gene in a modern organism as it evolves within a modern cell allows us to see whether the evolutionary trajectory once taken will repeat itself or whether, we'll, uh, whether a life will adapt following a different path. So they're trying to figure out, does evolution follow something that kind of guides it into particular modes, or does it just kind of go wherever it wants to? Um, as some of you may know, that's a debate that's been going on from uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who argued that it goes wherever it wants to, and we rewound the tape of evolution and played it again, we would find that uh, the likelihood is that people wouldn't exist, for example. Uh, in 2008, uh, uh, Kashars, or however you pronounce that, postdoctoral advisor, associate professor uh, of biology, Eric. I believe that's Gaucher. My French is not that good. Uh, successfully determined the ancient genetic sequence of elongation factor t TU, an essential protein in E. coli. Elongation factors are one of the most abundant proteins in bacteria found in all known cellular life and required for bacteria to survive. And about this time, most of you are going, what in the world is elongation factor? Well, let me explain. <coughs> you may remember that DNA has information in it that has to be copied and then transcribed to RNA and then translated from the RNA code into protein, amino acids. Um, copying and transcription are relatively easy and all you've got to do is match stuff and yet uh, they require several different proteins. Uh, translation requires, besides the messenger RNA to be translated to begin with, it requires uh, ribosomal RNA, this big machine that does the transcribing. There are two different kinds of ribosomal RNAs. And then plus some 40, in uh, E. coli it's 47, different uh, transfer RNAs. 
And that's so that you can match a particular codon to a particular amino acid. Now, um, theoretically, it should take 64, but some of them will do double duty, so that's why you can get away with only 47 in E. coli. But each one of those will require a special enzyme to tack the right amino acid onto the transfer RNA. Um, without that, uh, you couldn't get a match between the code and the amino acid. But it turns out that there's more than that. There are at least three additional proteins. Elongation factor TU, which is thermally unstable, which is uh, the same essential elongation factor that's found in um, uh, archaea, which is um, different organisms and bacteria have different structures in general, but this part they have to require the same uh, st structure, the same basic structure. And it's EF-TU, or uh, in bacteria, but it's called EF1A in, uh, in uh, archaea. And then there's EFTS, which is elongation factor uh, thermally stable. And finally, there's EFG, which is elongation factor that requires guanine. Well, as it turns out, EFTU also requires guanine, but this is one of the problems with trying to make names out of before you understand exactly what's going on. You wind up with names that don't necessarily completely fit the, uh, uh, the structure that you're naming. EFTU binds to amino acetylated transfer RNA, that is, after it's already had that uh, amino transferase that has tacked on the right amino acid to the right uh, transfer RNA. So then it gets fitted into this thing, and it protects it from hydrolysis while the uh, transfer amino acid, uh, the uh, transfer RNA and the amino acid are moving towards um, the ribosome. And um, then when it gets in there, uh, because uh, you can't tell ahead of time which one it should be, um, it moves into place, and if it sticks, then a transformation takes place, whereas if it doesn't stick with this big glob, it's easier to move out of the way so that another one can try. And uh, s some idea of how much stuff is going on at a time can be gotten from the idea that there are about 15 to 20 amino acids being added per second. And because you have to try different ones. That means that 15 or 20 um, uh, transfer RNAs will try it. Maybe 40, actually, from the average. It would be 40, 47 in the case of E. coli. We'll try that, and then one of them will actually fit. Well, it might be the first one. But on the other hand, it might be the hundredth one because several ones try that, that, uh, of the same kind that don't fit. So you have this, um, you have these things just moving in and out very rapidly. <coughs> and then when it does lock in place, a transformation takes uh, place on this, uh, on this elongation factor, which uh, cleaves off a phosphate from uh, this guanine triphosphate that's, uh, that's inside of it. And then uh, the whole protein changes shape, basically disengages from the transfer RNA and allows it to stick there. Um, and then the 
whole pro uh, the, the, the whole protein moves out of the way, and the thermostable protein comes in and removes the guanine diphosphate and allows a new guanine triphosphate to come back in so that it can go back and uh, collect another uh, transfer RNA that has its uh, amino acid attached to it. All very complicated. Um, you might say, well, isn't this a little too complicated? Couldn't we get, kind of get along without it? Well, it's found in every single cell, including our own. And if you take it out deliberately, if you um, cause a mutation to omit the gene, the organism cannot survive. So the answer is yes, it's absolutely necessary, at least as far as we can tell. You know, the more you look at this, the more complicated the system gets. Just when you thought you understood it, you find out that there are a bunch more things going on. And we probably don't understand the whole thing even yet. But we do understand enough to know that this is absolutely necessary to life. Now, when the right match is made, as I said, it hydrolyzes GTP, it changes conformation, it backs out. Um, and then it allows the transfer RNA to be processed by the ribosome. Uh, the third factor, by the way, goes in and uh, gives everything a little shove to move it up the next notch. Um, it's found in all bacteria. Can't get rid of it. Well, some people thought, ah, this gives us a wonderful opportunity if we assume that all of these things uh, are direct descendants of the last common ancestor, then we should be able to figure out what was the last bacterial um, transfer RNA, what it looked like. You know, it's sort of like taking um, uh, copying mistakes that we have now and going back and saying, well, what was the original? And then going back beyond that and saying, what was the original for, for uh, the common ancestor between archaea and, uh, by the way, uh, eukaryotes and uh, bacteria. And uh, so they decided to basically recalculate what it was. And then once they figured what the most probable original was, they created the DNA for it. And that's how you resurrect a protein. That vital role made it a perfect protein for scientists to answer questions about evolution because it's found in all different kinds of life and it's found in slightly different forms and so you could be able to figure out what the original was, or at least that's the theory. After achieving the difficult task of placing the ancient gene in the correct chromosomal order and position in place of the modern gene within E. coli, so they basically snipped out the old one, they put in a new one, Kachar, um, uh, produced, uh, produced eight identical bacterial strains and allowed ancient life to re-evolve. This chimeric bacteria composed of both modern and ancient genes survived but grew about two times slower than its counterpart composed only of only modern genes. The altered organism wasn't as healthy or as fit as its modern day version at least initially, said Gaucher. And this created a perfect scenario that uh, would allow the altered organism to adapt and become more fit as it accumulated mutations with each passing day. So what you're trying to see is, does it turn into the modern, um, the modern elongation factor TU? Or does something else happen? The growth rate eventually increased, and after the first 500 generations, the scientists sequenced the genomes of all eight lineages to determine how the bacteria adapted. Not only did the fitness level increase to nearly modern day levels, but also some of the altered lineages be actually became healthier than their modern counterparts. Evolving beyond today, 
The altered organism wasn't as healthy or fit as its modern day versions, at least initially, said Gaucher. And this created a perfect scenario that would allow the altered organism to adapt and become more fit as it accumulated mutations with each passing day. The growth rate eventually increased after the first 500 generations. The scientists sequenced, wait a minute. When the researchers looked closer, they noticed that every a EFTU gene did not accumulate mutations. Instead, the modern proteins that interacted with the ancient EFTU inside the bacteria had mutated. And these, you see, EFTS, for example, the, uh, uh, the ribosomal proteins, there are some proteins as well as amino acids, uh, pardon me, as well as uh, RNA in ribosomes. Um, in short, the ancient gene has not yet mutated to become more similar to its modern form, but rather the bacteria found a new evolutionary trajectory to adapt. And to answer the question that they posed, it appears that if you assume evolution, it looks like evolution can go more than one way. And then they presented these to the uh, NASA International Astrobiology Science Conference. And uh, you'll notice they're trying to answer the question that they said, uh, uh, that they mentioned at the outset. We think that this process will allow us to address several longstanding questions in evolutionary and molecular biology. Among them, we want to know if an organism's history limits its future and if evolution always leads to a single defined point or whether evolution has multiple solutions to a given problem. So that might answer how evolution got from point A to point B. Did it have to go there or did it not? Of course, that completely leaves aside the question of whether evolution got from point A to point B. Uh, just for the record, um, there are uh, the references that I've been able to consult while discussing this. Well, um, as it turns out, they, I was able to track down uh, the paper that they produced, uh, or at least one of the papers that they produced, and now you can see the uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but. Sedil. And and uh, and and how do you how do you pronounce that? Like an S. Like an S. So that's Kessar. Yeah. Okay. Now we have it from the French authority in the in the group. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, and um, here's the, uh, the abstract, and you'll notice that they uh, discuss all of this. One of the things that was odd was that they didn't talk about, in the abstract, um, the problem of having the, uh, the quote, ancient protein, um, stay the same while the rest of the bacteria adapted to it. Uh, I found that an interesting omission. Now, I'm just going to, uh, obviously I'm not going to read all four papers, um, but I wanted to go over some of the uh, highlights of some of them. A powerful and increasing use of synthetic biological approach is the computational reconstruction of ancient sequences of biomolecules using ancestral sequence reconstruction, an approach sometimes referred to as paleogenetics. It was initially proposed by Pauling and Zuckercandle, um, uh, but they didn't have the resources to be able to pursue it that we do now. Uh, it, it involves the alignment of DNA or protein sequences followed by the construction of a phylogenetic tree that is then used to infer sequencing of ancestral genes at a interior nodes of a tree using likelihood and or Bayesian statistics. And this is Eric Gaucher's uh, article. Um, so he's been involved with this uh, for quite some time. Um, they're now able to 
resurrect these ancient gene sequ sequences in the laboratory and recombinantly express the ancient genes using modern organisms in vivo or reconstituted in vitro translation systems. So then they can, they can engineer exactly orga the organism they, they think was back then or the protein that they think was back then and then they watch and see what happens to it as it interacts with uh, a modern organism. Um, and basically their idea is that this allows them to replay the tape of life and see whether it has to go down one track. Or whether, that, uh, whether it's chance or determinism that is largely uh, uh, making this thing go. And uh, uh, this is basically telling us it could go down one way only, or it could down, go down several ways. My uh, off right now. Um, uh, yes. Uh, I don't, we'll go, this one's on, okay. Quick, two quick questions. Number one, how do they determine that it was 500 million years old? What was, the, what was their evidence for that, number one? And number two, how much did the old quote-unquote gene differ from the modern quote-unquote gene? Um, uh, to take the second question first, there is a, it depends on which uh, organism you're talking about, but it's on the order of 15 uh, amino acids different out of were these, were these primarily SMP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or were they whole sections of the uh, transcribed gene which differed? Actually, they're prob primarily SMPs. Uh, and the reason for that is that this is an absolutely required piece of machinery. You don't have it, you don't uh, translate protein, uh, you, don't tra you don't translate RNA into protein, the cell dies. Um, so it has to exist within fairly tight limits. And uh, if you were to take out 20 amino acids, it just simply wouldn't fold into the proper arrangement. As a matter of fact, I think there are three domains in this thing. Um, and uh, so I mean, you can imagine, not only do the proteins have to, uh, the protein has to fold into the right shape, but each one has to fit into the, the other one, so that uh, all you'd have to do is to have, you know, a charged amino acid instead of a uh, uh, lipophilic amino acid in, in, in a particular spot, and suddenly uh, the, the protein uh, parts won't assemble. Well, there's also helper proteins that help the these are proteins get the right shapes, and that you have to fit into that like a lock and a key too. Yeah, that's well, why I was. You're getting this is very complicated, and, <laughs> and I wanted to know where exactly, and I still want to know how they know it was 500 million years old. Well, we're, we'll we'll come to that latter question uh, as uh, a little bit later. Uh, as far as I can tell, what they're basically saying is this is the ancestor of all uh, bacteria. I guess we've got the sound on now again. Something. Pardon me? What was the source of the ancient genes? Um, well, what they did was they found, they took E. coli, they took a number of different, I'm going to show you uh, uh, some of the uh, organisms that they used, and you can pour through the, the list of them. Uh, uh, but one of them is cyanobacteria, for example. So they're taking they're taking the elongation factor from a number of different organisms and comparing them and they're not identical but they're all pretty close and the idea is that if you say well these two organisms were descended from the original one uh, then you have two copies and you say it has to be somewhere in between those two uh, of course is it more like bacterium A more like bacterium B and the problem is that with its, each single amino acid 
uh, you're going to have to make that judgment. And it becomes, uh, it's not quite the same as if you have a whole lot of copies of a manuscript. Um, because as each one divides, you really don't have any clue as to whether amino acid A or amino acid B was original. And uh, the best you can do is an intelligent guess, and perhaps if you assume that it was B, and you go over here, and it was B, but there's some different ones that are, uh, that are uh, different, maybe you can reconstruct. Um, but it's always a, it's always a tough uh, call, because uh, if in this position it's A on one, and B on another one, and C on the third, then you have no way of telling what, with it, what the original was. Um, the, only, the only time it will help is if every, everybody else has B, and this one has A and one and B on the other, and then you can pretty much uh, guess that it's the same as the um, B that you had before. Um, Replacing network partners with their ancestors would permit us to rewire a network within the original, uh, within the historical context from which the mutational differences between the modern and ancestral proteins share a direct connection in evolutionary time. And so they're trying to be able to track this down, and they track it down to, I guess, 500 million years ago and put it back in E. coli. Um, the question of interest to us is whether the different components are capable of communicating. That is, is uh, we put in the old, supposedly old, the resurrected protein, or more precisely the DNA for it, and then we, we have it in a modern organism, and the question is, do the different parts have the proper interaction with each other? Um, at a certain point, they get so much different that they can't interact with each other. And one of the things that they were, I think, pleasantly surprised with was that, uh, in fact, you could put the old protein in, and although it didn't work as well, it did work serviceably. Um, but this I found very interesting. Uh, the question of interest to us is whether the different components are capable of communicating or whether they will fail to communicate and thus be functionless. Um, whoa was my first reaction. That, that must be which or something like that. What? Uh, somebody uh, goofed that word, I'm sure. But is the Tower of Babel? What is the Tower of Babel doing in a scientific article? Um, it must be a very powerful metaphor is the only thing I can say. <sighs> but uh, we anticipate that ancestral components will in fact be able to communicate in the hub better than modern components from different species as long as the ancestor lies along the evolutionary path that directly connects the two modern proteins. In other words, the ancestor probably won't be as bad a fit as if you took something from, let's say, Salmonella and stuck it in E. coli, or perhaps Proteus, or one of the other bacteria that are known. Maybe. Um, and um, they, they say, we're, we're sticking this into the plate, and we're going to see what happens. This creates an ideal scenario to watch the ancient component adapt within a modern network. Four possible scenarios may arise from such a system. And here they are. One, the ancient protein repeat, repeatedly adapts to the modern network in a manner identical or different to how its modern counterpart evolved. But as long as, uh, I, as, long as it follows the exact same pathway, that's determinism. Okay, two, the ancient protein adapts to the modern network in a manner different than how its descendant did, which means it goes in all different directions. That's contingency. 
The modern network adapts to the ancient protein in a manner identical to the ancient network, thus resurrecting the ancient network. Um, and finally, the modern network adapts to the ancient protein in a manner never evolved before in nature, thus creating an entirely new dialect. So maybe, the, maybe we'll get something that's uh, entirely different. Now that raises an interesting question. If one is following this line of reasoning, then what would be interesting is to find out which proteins adapted to the ancient protein in order to make it function even better than the modern one does now. And then create a tree to that and see whether that is also ancient or not. And uh, so far as I know, that hasn't been done. But you know, you can imagine the difficulty of doing all this work. It's a matter of uh, finding uh, differences, which means that you're going to have to do a whole lot of DNA sequences and then compare them. Um, Uh, EFs from thermophilic nuclei, uh, microorganisms, those are ones that grow like in hot springs and stuff like that, are thermostable, whereas uh, EFs from mesophilic organisms, that's things like E. coli, that likes to live at 37 degrees centigrade. Why does it like to live at 37 degrees centigrade? Because that's body temperature. Um, Actually, it's probably 38 degrees centigrade, but who's arguing over degree? Uh, when you're inside, the rectal temperature is a bit higher than the uh, standard, or maybe 37.5. Um, this suggests that a strong selective component shapes the thermostability pro profile of EF proteins. E. coli is unique among, the mo among most bacteria in that it contains two genomic copies of EF that is tooth A and tooth B, that differ from an, one another by a single amino acid. So what they did was they is inserted the ancient EF at the tooth B genomic location because this region of the chromosome is less populated with open reading frames of other genes compared to the tooth A location. So it's easier to not interfere with other protein uh, transcription. That's right. You've got proteins transcribing in one frame and proteins transcribing in another frame. Uh, you try to imagine how you do that um, by just uh, random mutations that, f that find uh, proteins. Um, as such, it, it's as if you had a, a computer program and then you had another computer program that overlapped the first. Um, and you can imagine the, uh, the tightness with which everything has to fit together. Um, as such, we knocked out TUFA A and measured this effect in growth. And we'll show you figure four in just a minute as a control for the comparative purposes. We also knocked out TUFA B in a separate strain to measure its effect in growth. And then we precisely swapped TUFA B for an ancestral EF gene in the tooth A knockout strain. So they put tooth A back in in the tooth B position. And this is what they got. This is a modern E. coli, multiplies once every about 25 minutes, something like that, 23. Um, this is the uh, modern E. coli, but you knock out the uh, tooth A. This is where you knock out the tooth B. And you can see that they give you virtually identical growth patterns. And uh, then this is the one with the ancient gene. Um, we anticipate that our ability to combine the two disparate fields, this is the conclusion of that article, of synthetic biology and experimental evolution will enhance our understanding of constraints that shape biologic evolution. If we are able to demonstrate that aspects of evolution are predictable regardless of whether this is due to strong selective constraints or due to historical events, this insight will be valuable in our ultimate attempts to generate artificial life and in our ability to maintain and, when necessary, constrain this life form. So they're 
basically what they're doing is they're building up the idea that if you fund our research, why um, we can maybe create a new kind of life and, um, and figure out how to keep it under control. Um, that's, of course, uh, aimed at the National Aeronautics and Space Agency Astrobiology Department, Exobiology. And uh, so that's where they're getting their money from, so they're making their pitch right there at the end. Um, now, I was curious about this um, resurrected protein and what they had done, so I ran down one of the references, which is, uh, uh, has uh, Gaucher as the lead author, and paleo temperature trend for Precambrian life in, inferred from resurrected proteins. Uh, this was kind of interesting. Uh, that's the uh, abstract, uh, biosignatures and structures in the geologic record indicate that microbial life has inhabited Earth for the past 3.5 billion years or so. Um, research in the physical sciences has been able to generate statements about the ancient environment that hosted this life. These include chemical compositions and temperatures of the early ocean and atmosphere. Only recently have natural sciences been able to provide experimental results describing the environments of ancient life. And our previous work with resurrected proteins indicated that ancient life had evolved in a hot environment. Here we expand the time scale of resurrected proteins to provide a paleo temperature trend of the environments that hosted life for 3.5 to 0.5 billion years ago. Notice the 0.5, that happens to be the age of this resurrected protein that they put back into E. coli. So somehow they figured out by the tree of life how that fits and I'm going to show you the tree of life in just a bit and I'm going to and you're going to go boy how do they figure that out um, our results are further supported by a nearly identical cooling trend for the ancient ocean as inferred from deposition of oxygen and isotopes the convergence of result this the convergence of results from natural and physical sciences suggests that ancient life has continually adapted to change in environmental temperatures throughout its evolutionary history. So you see you have data from one field and it meshes perfectly with data from the other field and so obviously they're both correct. But this is global cooling. Pardon me? This is global cooling. Global cooling, yes. Yes, this is the opposite here. You can comment at leisure now. And we'll capture that. Um, Now, here's where it talks about the, uh, uh, e for each side of the inferred sequence at a phylogenetic node, posterior values for all 20 amino acids are calculated and represent the probability that a particular amino acid occupied a specific site in the protein during its evolutionary history. They calculate all this stuff up and they find the most probable amino acid for a particular site. And uh, it's calculated from patterns of amino acids in modern sequences as described by a phylogeny, a matrix of amino acid replacement probabilities, amino acid equilibrium or stationary frequencies, phylogenetic branch lengths, and site-specific replacement rates. And uh, so basically they're making an educated guess at what the most likely uh, thing that fits in is. And uh, they note that this is actually a difficult problem to deal with. Despite insightful studies, the, ins the field of ancestral sequence reconstruction is encum encumbered by its inability to know whether inferred sequences truly recap recapitulate ancestral forms. Mm -hmm. Are we just uh, doing research or are we talking through our hats with uh, no relation to the ancient organism? Well. What I would really like to know, I, what I would like to see is someone like, um, and I'm going to use Greg Ventner's name because I went to a lecture where he was addressing something like this, what he would say about this paper. Because the lecture I went to, his whole theme was throughout the tree of life, what we need to do is reconstruct a tree of 
genes. There's about 100,000 mm -hmm. that are shared amongst in the biome, mm -hmm. and we need to find out how those genes evolved because there's so much horizontal gene transfer, especially at the bacterial level. And he gave numerous instances where you can put even diverse bacteria together, and pretty soon they ha all have the best enzyme for whatever you want to take. And that there's rapid, not only by plasmid, but by uh, numerous other means that the bacteria actually, his, his proposal was that bacteria and single uh, cell organisms, yeah, evolution was all about horizontal gene transfer. And then about 500 million years ago, when we had multicellular organisms, uh, then the Darwinian approach could be applied. But prior to that, it was foolish, quote unquote, to assume that horizontal gene transfer wasn't the driver. Well, so if there is horizontal tra gene transfer, if his statements are correct, then these guys have just made, in my opinion, a straw man argument that they're then going to, uh, you know, reap yeah. the rewards of. Well, uh. that's, a, that's a problem. And uh. one of the things that uh, you will notice is that they're careful <coughs> to say, we don't really know in the paper. Now, in the press release, you don't get that impression. Uh, but in the paper, they're perfectly willing to acknowledge that, uh, for example, uh, we have the inability to know whether inferred sequences truly reca recapitulate ancestral forms. We don't know if we're right. We're just making assumptions and then judging from those assumptions, and maybe that whole idea is incorrect. Um, Paul? Practitioners in the field acknowledge mm -hmm. a certain degree of inaccuracy associated with reconstructing ancestral sequences. Well, if you've got 15 different amino acids that you're arguing about, it uh, doesn't take much inaccuracy to pretty much invalidate your results. Uh, my, my question is more along the line. When they say, well, this one's ancestral and this one is not ancestral, how do they know that the ancestral didn't change as much as the modern one? Well, you see, if you throw a horizontal gene transfer in, then suddenly the, the more successful one simply um, uh, transferred its genes horizontally and maybe wasn't the original, and the original was the leftover one here. You have no way of knowing. That's, that's the whole problem. The concern is not necessarily whether the re resurrected form has the exact composition, genotype of the true ancestral form, but rather that the resurrected form displays the exact behavior, the phenotype. Now you have a real problem. Maybe it was enough differently shaped that it actually did different things way back when. Um, you know, this is, this is a consensus of a gene distribu distributed throughout a population before species divergence or before gene duplication. But there are all kinds of problems that you can see that, that they will note. Inaccuracies in a reconstructed sequence can result from sequence variation in the gene itself within an ancient population. Maybe there are two or three different kinds way back when, too. Hmm. Um, now, they're saying that sometimes they can fudge that because they all did the same thing, so therefore it doesn't matter what their precise amino acid com composition was. But in that case, you're not re reconstructing the original gene. Um, and they might find that bias in the reconstruction processes can, for example, lead to a preponderance of hydrophobic amino acids in an ancestral sequence. You know what that does? Um, that would mean that it would be more thermally stable. So maybe they just think it was more thermally stable back then than it really was. Keep that in mind when you look at all these things that are supposed to fit nicely. A similar form of bias is produced when the equilibrium frequencies themselves are incorrect. So there's all kinds of problems that they note. Here's one of their trees. Now, it may be hard to read some of that. This is right here, cyanobacteria. And you can see they have, they have trees that go up to here and trees that... Uh, the question is, 
this is the final common ancestor, I guess, right there and right there, they have only one group. Maybe really this should be the original group. And all of those other ones should be folded in. You can do that mathematically. How do you know which one is correct? They have it all nicely drawn, but you can see that even in their drawings, they have two different, uh, uh, two different groups. I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, whatever this bacterium is down here uh, seems to be the outgroup for everything. How do they know that's really the outgroup? How do they know, for example, that this isn't the outgroup? You get a very different tree. And there's the, their melting temperatures. And you will notice that it plots pretty well with this. Oh, well, here's one that's out of, out of line. But, eh, maybe. Of course, these ones will have more hydrophobic amino acids, so maybe there's a bias to that. In fact, it may depend on which outgroup you select as to what kind of a bias you get, and you might select the outgroups that are most likely to give you this kind of a pattern. So then you're not really looking at two <laughs> independent uh, uh, pieces of evidence. You're actually looking at one piece of evidence that was constructed to look independent. Uh, Paul, I, just a yes. question, question I on that previous one. How, how did they determine that geological time? Pardon me? How did they determine that geological time? Well, I'm sure they took the, the, uh, uh, the, the standard geologic ages, and they did oxygen-18 isotopes and assumed that that was, therefore, the temperature of the ocean at the time. In fact, um, it, it'll tell you that this is delta oxygen-18. And... Uh, and although it's not shown in analogous trend is seen with uh, delta-30 silicon. Now the question that I have is now that this is in the print, what would happen if you, if you tried to present a paper that said it had been flat all the way across? Um, would you be able to get that paper published? It's set in stone now, so to speak. Because after all, that's the generally agreed um, I watched uh, that happen with carbon-14 dates from Lake uh, Sugetsu in Japan, where at one time they thought it was, they were wonderful, and then they found out they disagreed with uh, some of the other ones, and so now they're not used in the, uh, in the reconstruction anymore. Because once you have kind of the gold standard set, if you don't reach answers that are compatible with the gold standard, you can't get published. It's a good thing they got this thing to work. Otherwise, they would have lost their funding. Um, reconstruction of um, ancestral EF proteins throughout the bacterial domain of life suggests that the organisms that host these extinct biomolecules lived in environments that had cooled progressively for about three billion years. This evidence is predicated on multiple assumptions. For, ex for instance, it assumes that the reconstruction of ancestral sequences recapitulates ancient phenotypes, and that phylogenies, phylogenies and divergence dates capture the evolutionary relationship and timing of bacterial divergence. Yeah, it does. And if those assumptions are wrong, uh, then all we have here is a bunch of data without any kind of organization. The observation that five samples from posterior distribution had equivalent thermostability profiles to that of uh, MPAS suggests that ancestral reconstructions are robust for phenotypes. That's figure two, is that one that has all the branches on it. Um, are robust for phenotypes even when uncertainties exist in the ancestral sequences themselves. In other words, it doesn't matter which way we do it, we still come up with the same data. Well. It does matter which way you do it. And you'll see why in a minute. Well, maybe about three minutes. Um, the observation that ancestral amino acid equilibrium frequencies produce an ancient protein with a phenotype equivalent to that of an ancient protein derived from modern amino acid frequencies 
demonstrates that ancestral phenotypes can be robust to violations of a priori parameters <laughs> contained within the evolutionary model. So that, yeah, it doesn't really matter which assumptions we get, we're still going to get the same answer. Mm -hmm. um, the inability, other than by time travel, I love that. To know the true relationship of bacterial lineages and their divergence times should not preclude attempts to understand Precambrian life. <coughs> In other words, we can't really check to see what we're doing, but let's do it anyway. Um, especially if you'll give us money to do it. Um, rather, a coherent description of ancient life can be generated when empirical evidence from diverse studies converge on analogous <coughs> conclusions. Um, okay, so it's important that the diverse things con uh, converge on analogous conclusions. Um, these descriptions are particularly useful when they have predictive value. For example, the last common ancestor of the mitochondrial bacterium is estimated to live 1.66 to 1.88 billion years ago on the basis of TM values for an ancestral EF proteins from the node, representing the origins of mitochondria, which is about there. <laughs> so that's consistent with that. Um, now, as the ocean cooled from 3.5 to 1.5 uh, billion years ago, life may have responded by adapting its range of growth temperatures uh, to correspond to its environment. This connection assumes that early life lived in the ancient ocean, which seems practical. But alternatively, it is possible that the inferred trend in paleotemperature reflects an ecological trajectory as ancient bacteria made the transition from hot springs and thermal events to the open ocean. In other words, it started out in hot places, and then as time went on, they got, they spread to the rest of the ocean, which was cooler. <coughs> and maybe the ocean wasn't that hot after all, even though our data seems to be good. Um, the similar, similarity in paleo temperature trends referred from, the inferred from uh, delta-18 oxygen and delta-13 silicon, that's the oxygen and silicon isotopes. Um, and ancient EF proteins is striking. Um, uh, for instance, the thermal stability of ancient EFs suggests that the origin of cyanobacteria occurred at an environmental temperature close to 63.7 degrees centigrade. Ooh, not 63.8 or that, that accuracy just amazes me. Uh, this is consistent with an upper limit, uh, upper temperature limit of typical cyanobacterial mats in hot springs, about 65 degrees centigrade, 63.7, <coughs> approximately. Um, the results demonstrate that ancient EF thermostability profiles are robust to uncertainties. Um, we've determined that certain ancestral EFs are indeed able to participate in peptide elongation when substituted for E. coli in a reconstituted in vitro translation system composed of E. coli components, data not shown. So this is in 2007, they're saying we actually have this other data, we just haven't published it yet, the one that they're now uh, presenting at MIT. And in the same article, and this may answer some of your questions, this is the supposed tree of life. You notice that Luca is not a single point, the last common, uh, less universal common ancestor, that it's actually more of a web. They don't, uh, but it's interesting that it narrows to branches, and the branches are completely separate from each other, and yet, my understanding is that horizontal gene transfer continued all the way through here so that this should actually be a big web as well, if you're going to be technical. And then I think this is the earliest bacteria and that's why that's 500 uh, BC is because it's one of these uh, branch points up here um, rather than a branch point that uh, goes to Archaea as well and to Eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, of course, being plants, animals, 
things like that. Um, other procedures for noting, this is, their, this is their commentary on this article. Other procedures for noting, es for estimating ancient environmental temperatures from extant molecular sequence data are known. So this is not the only one. For example, the amount of nucleic acid bases guanine and cytosine found in certain RNA sequences of modern day bacteria and archaea. This is RNA. C and G bind more tightly to each other than A and T. And so the more C and G, the, the better the organism can tolerate really hot uh, environments like hot springs. And in fact, if you look at bacteria that have uh, either DNA or RNA that you're looking at, uh, the hotter the bacteria grow at, the more of these GC pairs you have and the less of the AT pairs you have. Um, and that's what they're talking about here. Strongly correlate with environmental temperatures. Um, in fact, if you have it too tight, it doesn't unwind as well. So there's an advantage to having more AT in animals that live in a cooler uh, environment or organisms. So by determining these RNA sequences for ancestral microorganisms, the temperature of ancient habitats can be estimated. So this is another way of estimating besides this annealing temperature of this t temperature labile elongation factor. But this method has yielded conflicting results suggesting that very ancient light forms were hyperthermophilic, but also that the last universal common ancestor, Luca, of all modern life was mesophilic. Oh! Well, now, if everything converges to one, that means that it's secure. So if everything doesn't converge to one, does that mean that it's not secure? Um... Previous statistical estimates of protein sequences support the idea that LUCA was hyperthermophilic. Now, it might interest you to know that the reference here on 4 uh, is, is uh, in gene of 2001, but that the last universal common ancestor of modern life was mesophilic is um, by... Uh, a couple of people and, and this guy by the name of Goy, M. Now it might also interest you to know that Manolo Goy is the person who is writing, or one of the two people that's writing the article, the other one being Mark uh, Chalcidian, and you'll notice that he has his own paper in Nature from 2006 that isn't in this particular passage. But um, So Manolo Goy is saying, hey, wait a minute, I did some research on this, and it didn't say that it was hot back then. Well, let's see, what actually happened is that the bacteria at the poles were the ones that Goy found to be the last in common ancestor. See, so it could be cooler. And the bacteria at the equator were the ones that these guys are finding that are actually hot, with the oceans being hot. You know, you can always explain everything if you want to. Um, uh, Gaucher et al. proposed two possible scenarios. And, of course, the first is the bacteria from the Archaeans lived in hot oceans, and then the alternatively the bacteria could have started in hot springs and then spread out into cooler oceans. Now, this is interesting. Sadly, geological evidence that might discriminate between these two possibilities is scarce that even might discriminate. Archaean organisms are poorly preserved compared with those of the late Precambrian. Geologists have, however, found that laminated sedimentary structures that are about 3,430 million years old in the, that's 3.4 billion, in the uh, Pilbara Craton of Western Australia. By comparison with modern analogs, these stromatolite structures are interpreted as reefs constructed by cyanobacteria. <coughs> In addition, carbonaceous microstructures of a similar age have been found in 
bedded shirts from the apex formation of Western Australia. These are most probably fossils of bacteria or RKL, although the evidence for this is debated, still debated. I mean, it's so much debated that they don't even know whether it's bacteria or archaea. <coughs> Maybe well, it's neither. All they have is laminate, it looks like. All they have is laminated sediments, and they're assuming that they, therefore they must be stromatolites. Uh, nevertheless, the existence of these stromatolites in a fossil-bearing church and their modern enrichment in oxygen and uh, 18 oxygen and 30 silicon favor the idea that ancient bacteria lived in hot oceans. <sighs> now, my reaction to that. It's not clear what the age of the resurrected gene is. Maybe it's 500 million years. Maybe it's a billion years. I, I guess I hope that they're taking it from one of those lower branch points. They never actually said that. The molecular clock is on really shaky grounds for constrained sequences because you can't just mutate it every 100 million years or every you know, 10 million years or whatever because most of the mutations are going to die. So how you, get a, how you get a molecular clock out of that, I don't know. It is easy to forget the caveats when implying the study, and especially if one is being paid to produce interesting results. Um, which bacteria diverged from which is more difficult to determine when they may have been created separately. Uh, that's one of the problems I see, is that if, if uh, these are separate creations, uh, and in fact, massive lateral gene transfer actually argues for special creation. That's a point that's not always made. Um, the resurrection, in fact, may not be a valid process. On the other hand, maybe they have a point. Maybe it is, in fact, a valid process. But if that's the case, when the other proteins mutated to fit EFTU, the bacterium multiplied better in the lab than the, than the modern bacterium, suggesting that the ancient form was actually a better form. You see, if the, if the uh, uh, EFTU had mutated to fit its surroundings now in the new bacterium, then you'd say, well, E. coli is pretty well adapted mo in the modern world. But what's happening, apparently, at least some of the time, is that the ancient stuff is mutating to fit the old, or the modern stuff is mutating back, or forward, whatever, to fit the ancient EFTU. And that suggests that the ancient EFTU is actually better than the modern. Now, interestingly, that prediction was made completely independently by intelligent design advocates. They said, well, you know, you might actually see degeneration. And the modern stuff might not be as good as the ancient stuff. This starts to look like maybe that's the case. Now, I will have to say, there are so many caveats in this study that I have to say this is very, very soft evidence for intelligent design. And I certainly wouldn't use it to lead. But if somebody is going to use this as a paper to say, well, you have to believe in, intel uh, in evolution because all of the data fits, well, this is one piece of data that actually doesn't fit. The, the idea that the ancient organisms were better than the modern is a degenerating model, not an increasing model. Um, a better case to test this kind of thing would be the actually resurrected proteins of halobacteria. It would be fascinating to take them and put them in with the modern counterparts and see which bacteria flourished better uh, in, uh, in saline environments with um, a minimum of food of, as typical halobacteria have to live. Um, I have heard through the grapevine that that's been done and that in fact the, the ancient halobacteria beat the modern ones. Uh, which again argues for degeneration rather than for evolutionary advancement. Now, 
Some of the terms I think are ideal for using, uh, obtaining more funding. You talk about you know, resurrection, you talk about the Tower of Babel. Uh, one has to read the announcement, I think, with this kind of background. The, you if these people are not like, uh, for example, I am. You know, There's always going to be sick people. Um, I'm not likely to lose a job anytime soon. These people, if they don't get their next grant, they're out on their ear. They get to uh, drive taxis or something. Um, references to evolution, remember the people who are judging the grants want something that will advance evolution. And it may, uh, you may see in the article references to evolution that are, uh, shall we say, more positive than the data may be uh, actually supporting. Uh, and I think that also fitting after the fact may be going on if you're looking at how those different kinds of uh, bacteria are arranged so that we know which one was the ancestral. I think we may be looking at a, uh, uh, somebody who arranged them because they knew what kind of an answer they needed at the end. Um, the experiments really did not test evolution in any non-trivial way, and therefore they cannot be said to have supported it significantly. And I have one final question that comes to me as I read this, and I'm just going, uh, I'm having a harder and harder time believing all this stuff. And that is, most people figure that a warm little pond is a good place to start life. And it's you know, it's tough to start life, but I guess a warm little pond might be the best place. What I can't figure out is how did life get started in hot water? You know what hot water does? It breaks apart organic molecules. Um, there are very few organisms that can live in the environment of, let's say, the hot springs at Yellowstone Park. Um, what this does is it narrows down significantly the kinds of organisms that could have been the original ones. And if I try to take that model and I try to run with it, I immediately find myself, if you'll pardon the expression, in hot water. I think that's one of the things that these people haven't even thought of. Because after all, everybody knows that evolution happened, and it happened without guidance. And so therefore, the fact that it's there, <laughs> nobody asks, well, doesn't this make evolution harder? Well, it technically, it doesn't make evolution harder in one sense. But what it does do is it makes the origin of life a whole lot harder. Not only do you have the problem of uh, the, uh, trying to get all that information out of somewhere, but you have the problem of trying to do it while the nascent uh, mm -hmm. organic molecules are continually breaking apart. And you know, I have seen people argue, for example, that it happened on ice. And actually, that makes a certain amount of sense because it would be easier to make. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is here that there are only a few organisms that can live in that kind of environment. So you have a much narrower target to go at. And as you're building up organic molecules, they're constantly being broken apart, more so even than they would be on the surface of the Earth. Um, at that, I will leave uh, further comments to the floor. You're simply stating that uh, the probability of life arising is higher in uh, cooler temperatures than in hot water because the organic molecules needed would not survive as well. Well, that's. I mean, that's, the, I think, the obvious implication. If you try to, for example, the, the best scenario I've ever seen is RNA world. It's not very good, but it's the best they've got, I think. Put RNA in hot water and see what happens. Uh, 
all of a sudden your RNA world I think is just cooked. Yes. Paul, I think that's why we're, uh, what is it, we've spent $2 billion to send the latest probe up to Mars. They're really looking for life there because that will take the monkey off their back here and we can go to the transpermia type of approach and um, we don't need to look for the source of life down here. We don't have to. They will continue to, but we don't have to now. You've got a backup source. It came, uh, you know, via meteor or whatever and um, so it's, it's, uh, I think that's one reason they're, they're there. Well, that's, I, the, thing, the thing of it is, I think that exobiology is actually simply looking for life in other places because if it happened in other places, then it makes it a little easier to argue that it could happen here mm -hmm. without uh, there being any uh, guidance involved. But, you know, you, the primordial, all of the different scenarios have the atmosphere having lots of very bad actors in the uh, atmosphere that would kill off any life form that we know yeah. now. And so what, what, what Mars gives them is a new incubator to get around all that problem, all those problems. And they can simply say, those problems, we got around them because, you know, we got seeded from Mars and we're fine now. So, ex for example, if we found mm -hmm. that the Earth's atmosphere had lots and lots of oxygen in it, which we have. Or cyanide or sulfuric acid or well, many other oxygen's things. bad enough all by itself. Yeah. Right, it's an oxidizer, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> uh, I mean, when you do the Miller-Urey experiments in, yeah. a, in an oxidizing atmosphere, you get nothing. You have to have a reducing or at bare minimum, a neutral uh, uh, environment. In other words, you could have carbon dioxide and water and stuff like that, but, the, but you put little tiny p bits of oxygen in there and the thing disappears. Um, and yet, the earliest deposits that we have of stuff that you could use to judge that, uh, iron, uh, banded iron deposits <coughs> suggest that oxygen was there way back when those were laid down, which is the standard scenario is, you know, three billion plus years. Um, about the same time as the origin of life. <coughs> uh, that means that you can't go there. And um, so the, what you can do with Mars is you can say, well, it was always reducing. So that's one of your little it's bugaboos out, to, out of the to way. Go out. And, and that's why I think they're going to such, uh, I'm very curious. I mean, I love what they've done. I'm not demeaning what they've done. I think it's great. But I believe that's one of, that's one of the main motivating <coughs> factors. Yeah, and, it, and if you look at what's happened, you know, every so often they'll find a Mars rock or they'll <coughs> get some interesting chemical reactions from one of their rovers. and. All of a sudden, somebody will spew out, well, we found life, or we found mm -hmm. evidences of life. And then you wait another month, and people will look at it with a little more cool-headed, and they'll say, nah, that wasn't life. But wh what I wonder, you know, supposing they find carbon-based life, evidence for carbon-based life on Mars and so on, uh, what is to say that it rose there by itself and, and versus its contamination from the Earth via uh, meteoritic uh, impact and so on, like they suggest for some Mars uh, meteorites came to Earth, for which they have you know fairly good evidence that 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 does occur. Uh, we do have Earth so Earth uh, impact meteorites, you know. Uh, yeah, that so uh, that created uh, creators like um, um, Chilix Cab, but I'm also thinking of Chesapeake Bay, and there's bigger ones. But finding life on Mars could, could just be contamination. We're spending a lot of money here for, for checking this out. Yeah. Well, see, this is what happens when you ignore the question of intelligent design. Uh, if there's intelligent design, then, then one could have designed life and have it spread from Earth to other places. And the life could have happened very early in Earth's history, or perhaps very late, but very early in Earth's surface history. 
Um, but you see, if you have intelligent design, then science goes out the window. At least the way they're doing science. Because no longer can you say, well, these must have had a common ancestor. They might have had a common designer. And God figured that the protein that he used for this organism works perfectly well in this organism, so he used it. And therefore, you don't have to have things like bacterial rhodopsin show up in rice and not in corn, wheat, soybeans, various grasses, anything like that, just rice. Otherwise, what you have to do is you have to say, well, rice must have gotten in that gene from a bacterium. <clears throat> in fact, this is an interesting point because one of the, one of the things that people who are arguing for not undirected processes, whether they be theistic evolutionists or whether they be uh, atheists. The atheists make more of it, I think, is to say, well, why would God create a slightly different cytochrome C for each different organism? Well, what they've been forced to do is to acknowledge that, in fact, the last common organism wasn't an organism. It was a mass of organisms that were sharing genes like mad. But think about it. Supposing, well, we've done this actually. Supposing that the Earth were to endure a massive meteoric catastrophe or perhaps a nuclear winter that wiped out all of uh, life except for a little island out near Madagascar. And there, there were some blue roses. Okay, so we don't know anything about the people who have done all this stuff. Those blue roses got their blue pigment from um, one of the blue flowers. It looks just like the pigment in those flowers. There's some little tweaking that had to be done to make it uh, actually come up, it would look like lateral gene transfer. Well, it was lateral gene transfer. It was just, um, shall we say, assisted lateral gene transfer. The point of it is, when you see lateral gene transfer, it's soft, but it's actually evidence for intelligent design rather than against. We have a hand in the back there. Well, it seems like uh, primarily what we've been discussing, as interesting as has been, is that uh, we're, we've finally determined that a 500 million year old uh, gene looks very much like a modern one. So there hasn't been a lot of change. And where did the original gene come from? That still hasn't been explained. So I think we've been going around in circles and there's a lot of science to it. It's very complicated and it's nice, it's interesting to study that and, and learn to understand what's going on, but uh, we still haven't gotten anywhere real on the whole debate of origins. Well, I think this is the reason why they want to concentrate on evolution instead of on the big picture, because the big picture includes the origin of life. And you see, if you start out with a complicated enough organism, then that organism can change from one to another, I mean, because it can stay alive. But what this says is that it's really tough to make life. In order to make life, you not only have to have DNA and RNA and ribosomal RNA and transferases. Now you have to have these kind of crazy proteins that, that kind of assist the transfer RNAs to get into the ribosome at the right time. And those proteins are absolutely necessary. It's just complicating, one more complication that says you have a certain minimum genome that you have to get before you can have it sustain itself. This is making it harder 
for RNA world uh, sequences. Yeah. No. One question, uh, Paul. There isn't a separate uh, EFTU for each amino acid. There's no, as I understand one, it, one it's that one to that all. does the whole works. Yeah. Okay. So it has to be a. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm not. I'm still not sure why it can check to see whether the amino acid, and the and the tRNA are. Are the uh, match each other. Supposedly that's one of its functions, but mechanically I'm not. Uh, I'm not getting exactly how that works. I just have a question. Um, in, in when you read the genetic literature, which is very fascinating, a bit, I wonder how it is that all of the reagents that are needed for these reactions are right where they need to be. If you look at this um, cytoplasm of a cell, it, you know, it, it, it looks like it, it's, it has millions of molecules. I don't know the exact number, but they're all in there. It looks like packed like um, sardines in a can. They're all moving around. How do all the right reagents get lined up, marshaled to go right in 20 amino acids a second? Yeah, that's moving, especially when you have many failures along the route. Those so are 20 successes. Out. So you can factor that by a fairly high number of the number of molecules that have to go in there and try and be rejected, the total number of molecules that fit in. It would be about 400 molecules a second or something like that. Who marshals that? How does the cell marshal that? How does it bring those, those uh, molecules and line them up? I mean, and that's just one of the ribosomes that's working. You have thousands of ribosomes working, and they're all kicking in at this, this speed. Who is making sure that all the right products and reagents and everything are lined up and in the right place when you're looking from our eyeballing it, even with electron mi um, microscopy, it just looks like it's all in there in a big, you know, it's in a container and you got all this machinery in there, and yet it all works pretty flawlessly with all of the needed just-in-time um, uh, reagents going in so you can get product. And how, I, has how anyone ever have looked? Just the right number of. Yes. Of has anyone ever looked how that? Who sets up the organization of the cell? I guess is what I'm saying. How does it organize so that it can perform all of these intricate, very, very specific enzymatic reactions and have everything in the right place at the right time? Um, I don't know that we have the answer to that. And uh, you know, sometimes as I look at this more carefully. My reaction is very much like that of Job. I, you know, I'm opening my mouth about things that I have no clue. After you have this thing working, then you've got to have something that reproduces the whole system again. And this is really, really tough. And make sure that you got uh, enough on each side so that the machinery can keep going. Uh, you know, I think. I think one of the things that we have sometimes done is thinking that we can understand this so well that we can actually figure it out. And uh, we are still uh, very much in the position of Newton, you know, looking at a particular seashell with the entire beach before us. The This is one of the things that happens um, when, when we look and understand how much we really don't know. To try to say that we know that God couldn't have been involved, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And the thing of it is, if God was involved at any step, then he can do whatever he wants. Then we are far more dependent on what he says to us than we are on how we can figure things out. And, you know, it's tempting to say that the approach of this book, which is mostly theological, is really not good. Perhaps it's not persuasive for our age because we're in awe of science. But maybe we should be less in awe of science 
and we should be more credulous of uh, actual historical witnesses. And in that case, I think we need to be really, really careful about trying to build everything up from science alone. Because the fact of the matter is, we just don't have the data to be able to do that. I mean, even this picture that you've seen is not probably complete. There's probably other uh, the proteins that make sure that all the proteins fold. In fact, we know that in some cases that's the, that's the case. So we need not only these things, but we need chaperones, and there are probably other proteins that do other functions that we don't even know about. You make a good point, because the chaperones have to, they go through what's translated in the, in the nucleus, and if they don't like something there, they won't take it out. And they'll signal for um, uh, DICER or one of the other proteins to come in and chop it up, uh, enzymes. They, they proofread what's transcribed in the nucleus, and then they take it out to the specific ribosome where they've got a lock and key, and they lock into that, uh, and only that lock and key will get them into that ribosome, which is then the particular one they need to make that protein. It is highly organized. Everything is charted as to where it's to go, and that's my point. How does that, how does that um, uh, get done going from the nucleus to find out, find that ribosome in this sea of chemicals, of biological active enzymes that are going on at feverish pace? How do they make their way and know right where to go? And I know I'm talking teleologically, but I don't know how else to present the case. You know, I'm reminded of Aaron, who uh, tells Moses, well, you know, people wanted something, so they gave me the earrings, and I tossed it into the fire, and out came this calf. You know, um, once there was not life, and then we tossed in a little lightning, and a little carbon dioxide, and a little methane, a little ammonia, and out came this organism. Furthermore, it was a thermophilic organism. And Excuse we've been me? just talking, we've just been talking proteins here, and then you got to, remember, you need some DNA to start this whole system. And uh, that's a whole other story. You have to have the DNA and you have to have the protein, and the DNA has to code for the protein that happens to be there. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, anyway, next week we'll uh, resume uh, in the beginning, and uh, I think maybe with a new appreciation of, of how important it is to listen to the actual record. <laughs>